Welcome to episode 254 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my award-winning books, blog, and podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Daniel DeSimone, who served in the FBI for 23 years. Dan was initially assigned to the Los Angeles field office before being transferred to the Philadelphia division, where he obtained FBI undercover agent certification and performed a variety of undercover assignments. In this episode, Dan reviews Operation Thin Crust, a long-term undercover operation conducted in 1998. Dan played the undercover role of the manager of an escort service covertly set up by the FBI to gather evidence that associates of the New York Gambino crime family were trying to enter the lucrative Las Vegas escort service industry, also known as the outcall industry. Dan and the case agents had to act quickly when, while monitoring intercepted conversations, they learned that three mob enforcers were planning to kidnap, torture, and maybe even kill competitors. Later in his career, Dan was promoted to unit chief of the Undercover and Sensitive Operation Unit at FBI headquarters. He also provides insights about the FBI's undercover program during this episode. Prior to Dan's retirement from the FBI, he served as the FBI's lead to the private sector and in 2011 was awarded knighthood by Pope Benedict XVI for his career in public service, his actions in his private life, and for leading the 2008 papal visit to the United States. Currently, Dan is the Senior Director of Investigative Resources at Thomas Reuters, where he serves as the company's chief interface with law enforcement agencies and corporate security services. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. But before we get to it, I want to make sure that Reader Team members received my March email, where I share some exciting announcements and review the new NBC FBI TV series, The Endgame. If you haven't yet seen my email in your inbox, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and promotions tab. I also want to remind you to send in your questions for the FBI Recruiting and Training Update episode. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there are links to where you can buy me a coffee, visit my website to learn about my nonfiction and crime fiction books, and to join my reader team to keep up to date on the FBI in books, TV, and movies. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Dan DeSimone. Hey, Dan, how are you? Hi, Jerry. I'm great and looking forward to telling you this story today. Good. So am I. We got a chance to see each other a few months back in D.C. I'm so glad that I saw you. Actually, Frank Fuguzzi had reminded me that you were once the unit chief of the undercover. What's it called? Undercover and Undercover and Sensitive Operations Unit. But before we get into that, for your listeners, we saw each other at an event in November, 2021, it wasn't just an event. It was the annual FBI agents association gathering and you, Jerry, were the star of the show for all your achievements in the FBI and post FBI. We have to get that in there as a plug for you. Thanks, Dan. It was a magical evening. It really, really was. And it was really special to have old friends like you there to support me. So thank you for mentioning that. Sure thing. I had always wanted to get you on the show to talk about your own undercover adventures and to talk a little bit about the undercover program, because it is actually one of the most popular topics or violations that people come on the show to talk about. We're going to do the case review first, and okay. then we'll do a little bit about the undercover program. So where do you want to start with the case review? 
you know, everyone's kind of heard the phrase, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And that's not normally the case. The backdrop here is 1998. And what we're talking about is the adult entertainment and outcall industry in Las Vegas, circa 1998. And remember, how is 1998 different from today? There were no smartphones back then, just pagers or beepers. And maybe your listeners are so young, they don't know what a pager or a beeper is, but I'm sure Wikipedia can educate them on that. We used landline phones to communicate. And you know what? There wasn't websites predominant back in those days. And businesses advertised via the yellow pages of the phone book. I can't tell you the last time I even saw a phone book, Jerry. And in Las Vegas, it's the only place back then in the United States that published the phone book in the yellow pages twice a year. And if you had a 1998 Vegas phone book, you would see that the ads for adult entertainment and outcall services were well over an inch thick. Seemingly hundreds of these businesses were there. And how they operated at the time is you call the business and you would have someone for a set fee back then it was a hundred dollars come visit you in your hotel room and entertain and dance and so on and so forth. And when we use the word out call, I think people recognize it better as escort service. Is that correct? You are correct. And to this day, if you go to Las Vegas, you can see these advertisements on trucks going up and down in the strip. Call this number and it'll say, girls will go to your hotel room. Men will come to you all within an hour. It is an ongoing and long-term business practice, for lack of a better term, in Las Vegas. But yes, you're correct. Adult entertainment, outcall, escort service, etc. Those hundreds of advertisements were really at front because there was only about 10 businesses that really did this. In their business, if you were inside their business, it would be a phone. And remember an old landline phone where it had 10 or 20 buttons on it. Line one might be hello college co-eds. Line two may be exciting entertainment and so on and so forth. But there was really 10 of these and the majority. Of that's fascinating. I have to say that's fascinating to hear that they would just keep advertising the different segments of their offerings, but they were just really concentrated to a small number. Oh yeah. And out of that small number, three men controlled 90% of all businesses. One of those gentlemen actually had his roots back in the Philadelphia area many years ago. A son of a former LCN, and that stands for La Cosa Nostra, intertwined with the words mob and mafia, a lot of people use it. This gentleman had a fledgling adult outcall business in Vegas. His name was Cristiano Di Carlo, Chris Di Carlo for short. Chris is very central to this story. Young man, probably in his mid to late 20s, like walking out of GQ, with the mindset of a Wall Street businessman. He had a lot going on. These businesses back then in the late 90s could make tens of thousands of dollars a night in cash. Chris's outcall business was generating handsome sums of cash, but then it suddenly stopped to a trickle. Maybe 90% of his business went away. He couldn't understand it. Chris was sending some of his profits back to New York out of respect, what is often referred to as tribute in the La Cosa Nostra world. That's a common occurrence. And these monies were sent to a man named Mario Stefano, who was part of the Gambino crime family. And in 1988, the Gambino crime family was run by the infamous John Gotti. Historically, Las Vegas was, in the words of the mafia, was called an open city. And that meant there was no particular Belsian family controlling it. What happened at times in this particular case is that the New York Gambino crime family was seeking to expand its presence out there in Las Vegas and specifically in the adult entertainment industry. Chris DiCarlo's business was kind of the litmus test of how it was going. So you can understand a lot of people weren't happy when DiCarlo's business generating lots of cash, all of a sudden sees 90% of its profits. I would imagine that they don't necessarily 
believe him either when he says, I don't have any money to send up to you because the business isn't doing well. Sure. Word kind of started getting around town. Someone was controlling the phone. At that time, Las Vegas had several phone banks, of course, the hotels, all the many hotels, even in the late nineties, to put it in simple terms, the belief was that when you called the Carlos business, you would get his business. He would send someone out. It would generate cash. But the belief was that someone was infiltrating the phone company. And when you called the Carlos business an illegal call forwarding actually went to those three men that controlled 90% of the business already. So in essence, they were stealing business from the smaller adult entertainment business operators and illegally call forwarding it to this group of three who really controlled the block of all business. It was one way for them to kind of choke off their up and coming competition. Right around that time, another adult outcall business began in Vegas, and that was called Casa Blanca West. Casa Blanca East was operated just outside of New York City and owned by a man named Tony, who was from New York and thought, I'm going to branch my business out to Las Vegas. As this illegal call forwarding conspiracy made it around town, Chris DiCarlo approached Tony. And you wonder why of all people did he approach Tony? Well, Chris knew of Tony from the New York La Cosa Nostra. You see, decades prior, Tony was told by an LCN soldier, hey, listen, car got stolen here and a made man's kid stole it. But why don't you do us a favor? You say you stole it. You'll spend a week in Rikers and we'll be forever indebted to you. And Tony, being the young man in New York and knowing how things work, said, sure. Unfortunately for Tony, one week in Rikers turned out to be one year in Rikers. And he held the grudge for many, many, many years. Jerry, as you know, from being an FBI special agent, there are a lot of reasons why people, average citizens, come to the FBI. It may be simply out of their patriotic duty. It may be for money. It may be for revenge. What happened was Tony held this grudge for years against the LCN. So when Chris DiCarlo told Tony, hey, we trust you for what you did for us decades ago. I want you to join forces with me and we're going to find out how these three adult out called business owners, how they're forwarding these phones and costing us millions. And then Tony, we're going to get rid of them. Well, when Tony heard that, he said, Chris, I'm in, I'm with you. But what he didn't tell Chris Jerry is that he would later contact the FBI. Tony in his heart felt this is a way to get even with the LCN who he served a year in jail earlier on. When the FBI in New York received this information from Tony, they contacted the FBI office in Las Vegas. The FBI office in Las Vegas at that time heard of the potential Gambino crime family push into Las Vegas and specifically into the adult entertainment business. And the FBI thought, wow, this is a great opportunity for us to really make a case to really find out what is happening with the La Cosa Nostra in Las Vegas, which as a lot of your listeners know, has a storied history, Las Vegas and the mob. The Las Vegas FBI had a problem. They needed to remove the owner from that situation. They didn't want him in the middle of it. The owner of Casa Blanca West, Chris DiCarlo, the son of a former mobster in New York wanted to go after the three gentlemen that owned the majority of outcall businesses, adult entertainment businesses. And it was those three men that he believed was behind this illegal call for me. Chris approached Tony, the owner of Casablanca West, and it was Tony who ultimately went to the FBI. So think of it, it was Chris and Tony versus the three outcall industry leaders. So the FBI said, we can't have the owner, Tony, in Casablanca West. We got to get him out of there. So it was decided that Tony's manager at Casablanca West would be the local contact for Chris DiCarlo and the Gambinos. Who was Tony's manager? Well, it was a guy named Carmine Borelli. And Jerry, in real life, Carmine Borelli was me. Philadelphia <laughs> Special Agent Dandy Simone. 
Now, why did you pick that name? I have to ask that. The first and last name have a personal significance to me. My middle name undercover was Dan Carmine D. Borelli. So I clearly would answer to Dan when I heard the name Carmine or when I heard the name Borelli, I would turn because there is personal significance to that. That's important. You never want to be somewhere and people are calling your name and either you have to tell them that you have a hearing disability or they start wondering, are you really who you are? That was my name and that's what I went to Las Vegas. So I left Andy Simone back in Philadelphia, right there in 600 Arch Street, just down the hall from where you were working. Everything that existed in Las Vegas, from my car to my apartment, my bank account was Carmine Borelli. How did I get there? I was sitting at my desk right there in Philadelphia and my phone rings and I heard the famous words that makes every street agent kind of get taken aback. Hi, this is FBI headquarters. And then you start going, hmm, I didn't think I was going to be transferred because I had just recently been transferred to Philadelphia. And they said to me, this is so-and-so from headquarters. Are you Italian? Yes. Have you ever lived in Las Vegas? No. Do you have any relatives in Las Vegas? No. Dan, we see that you're this old. And at the time, I was in my late 30s. And they said, would you mind flying to Las Vegas and being interviewed for a potential undercover operation? I said, okay. The Philadelphia and the Las Vegas offices had to agree, which they did. Special agent in charge, Bobby Siller in Las Vegas. Bobby retired and went on to run the aiming commission. Were you like registered that you were interested in participating in the undercover program? Had you gone through undercover training? Why you? How did they sure. call you? Yeah, it wasn't an accidental dial. I was a certified undercover agent six years earlier. I had been certified while I was in the Los Angeles field office of the FBI and had only did very minor spot undercover roles up until then. Yes, the FBI headquarters folks keep a database. They look for what they would consider an appealing candidate, one that would connect with, build rapport with the targets, etc. You wouldn't want to have any type of quality that would rebel the targets because with undercover work, it's about getting close to the targets of the investigation, potentially getting them to confide in you what their criminal plans are. And if you're lucky enough, you get that on a recording so that there's nothing better when you go to court than to use their own words against them. I fit the general parameters of what they were looking for. I fly off to Vegas and I meet several people, the case agent, and that's the gentleman or lady who run the entire investigation, the contact agent, someone who, when I would come up for air and needed to meet someone from the FBI, that's the contact agent, or I needed to hand off recordings so that they could be put into evidence. Another role of the contact agent, more importantly, I had to meet the owner of Casablanca West, Tony, and just make sure that we wouldn't be oil and water, that we could kind of get a story together of how he knew me, how I became his manager out there, and so on and so forth. It all meshed. So I flew back to Philadelphia, finished some things up there. And in June of 1998, I left Special Agent Dan D. Simone behind and moved to Las Vegas, got my apartment and my car, and became Carmine Borelli, the manager of Casablanca West. And I would interject to say that everyone in Philadelphia who didn't need to know that didn't know that. We just knew that Dan was gone. Yeah, generally speaking, that's how it is. When we say an undercover operation, even in this particular criminal undercover operation, the FBI has to formally launch an authorized undercover operation. There's rules on what you can and cannot do, even in an undercover operation. And that's governed by the attorney general guidelines on FBI undercover operations. I always like to say the good guys always have to play by the rules, Jerry. The bad guys, not so much. The foundation was put in place. All the proper authorities were underway. I began my new life. Within a week of my arrival, I was introduced to Chris DiCarlo, 
by Tony, the owner of Casablanca West. And then Tony left shortly after that. De Carlo told me, Tony's with me, which means you are here. I'm going to get a percentage of your business here at Casablanca West, and you'll be protected by me and our friends in New York. Hey, let's do lunch next week. And by the way, bring 10 grand for our friends in New York. That was the big first move. Obviously, I reported that back to the FBI there in Las Vegas. The agent in charge, Mr. Siller, had to approve the $10,000 payment to DiCarlo. Once we gave him that money, we didn't know whether he was going to send it to folks in New York or whether he was just going to keep it for himself. Chances were we would never see that money. So we had to make sure that money was going to yield us some important evidence. And it did. And one of my first, what I'll call really interesting situations. Picture this. I found myself wearing a wire and in 1998, technology was good, but it wasn't necessarily really advanced. So I literally wore a wire from something hidden in my shoes all the way up and under my shirt was a microphone. And there I'm meeting Chris DiCarlo at Spago's restaurant in Caesar's Palace on the Strip in Las Vegas. I got to stop you for a minute because you just told us that previously you had done some undercover roles, but they were minor and they were small. So now you're in the big lead. What are you feeling? You know, I'm feeling energy. I'm not afraid. There were surveillance teams on me. We were in a public place and I kept telling myself, this guy wants money. I bring him the $10,000. I think it's kind of blind him. And he's going to feel that we're going to obey him, follow his lead and do everything. I felt really energized. Are you armed? No, not armed. But again, there were surveillance people around me, others having lunch, others walking up and down. Because if you've ever been to Caesar's Palace, there's like a promenade, like an inside mall. And then right amongst one of the many stores is Spago's restaurant. So it was an easy place. It's not like he said, meet me behind this desolate building. It's just you and him. So this is a public place. You know, the 10,000 fit in a nice envelope, but it was the quintessential Las Vegas and crime. Spago's restaurant, Caesar's Palace, on this trip in Las Vegas, getting ready to turn over that $10,000. And I kind of played a little game. So I had the envelope. And I saw his eyes and he looked at the envelope, but I would like go to give it to him. And then I'd try to get some questions out of him. And he's like, well, all right, here's how this is going to work. Did you bring the money? Oh yeah. Yeah. I got it right here. Well, what specifically do you need me to do, Chris? He says, well, Hey, you know, Tony took the pinch years ago, decades ago for one of our friends, sons back in New York. So, you know what? We trust him. He says, you're a good guy, which means you're in with us. That was probably the first mistake they made. They're seeing dollar signs and they're so angry with these three other business owners that they probably should have done even more due diligence, but lucky for us, they didn't. Here's what I catch on the wire recorded. The problem is the surveillance people can see me, the case agent and the contact agent, they're in the parking structure. They can't hear it. Nobody could hear what's going on. They could only see the body language back and forth. And Chris tells me this. He says, hey, you know, I believe these three owners are stealing from me, which means they're stealing from our friends in New York. And they're doing this by illegally forwarding customer calls from my business to theirs. And I've talked to a few others. They're seeing their businesses drop by 75, 80% as well. So in one of the more classic lines of the undercover operation, Chris said, Hey, listen, I told New York that out here, you just can't take these three guys out to the desert and put a bullet in their head. And New York said, why not? Hey, this is Vegas. This ain't New York. He says that would get noticed. Wow. So I say, wow, this is like really cool. This is real stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sitting in Spago's in Las Vegas talking to a mob associate, getting ready to pay him money. He's asking for my help. They're going to kill people. The FBI has a responsibility to protect those people, even if they are potentially criminals themselves. And I'm thinking, wow, this is so neat. I continued to listen. 
Chris says, so here's how we're going to do it. He says, what do you need? He says, we're going to grab one of them and we're going to take him out in the desert. And we're going to tell him, I think you ripped me off. You owe me half a million dollars. We hold him until he pays it. He's got 24 hours to pay it. If he doesn't pay it, he gets a bullet in the back of his head and dies in the desert. And if that happens, I'm sure the other two guys will see how things need to be. And they'll probably pay us after that. And I got all of that on tape. And this is the first real conversation and you've already hit it out of the park. Chris DiCarlo says, hey, do you have my money? I says, oh yeah, it's right here. Here it is. All $10,000 as you asked. He says, okay, keep your business going. You give me a percentage of what you make every night. You're with us and you'll get the same protection that I get to. And I'll pass on to the folks in New York that you were a good guy and provided this money. What does it mean from an FBI perspective? I remember leaving lunch. Chris went one way, I went another. And then I just didn't like run out to meet the agents. I sat there, played a few slot machines, things of that nature, just in case. And then I got a prearranged signal from the surveillance squad that it looked like it was clear that nobody was doing counter surveillance because Jimmy, what we didn't know is there could have been two other people, two tables away who basically were hired by DiCarlo to say, Hey, watch Borelli when he leaves, see if he talks to anybody, where does he go? We have to look for things like that because that could be a safety issue or a mistake like that could just cost the entire case. Ultimately, I make my way back to the case agent and the contact agent in get in the car and they say, how did it go, Dan? Because this is the dividing line. If you got something good, we're going to be able to run this case. If it's circumstantial or if you didn't get anything, this is going to be a tough uphill battle. So I told them what happened. He took the money. He laid out the plans about how they were going to take one of the owners in the desert. He didn't pay, kill him. And case agent and the contact agent were, congratulations, Dan, you did a great job. This information and the recording went back to the FBI. We immediately checked the recording to make sure that it sounded good, sounded clear, nothing better than having a criminal's voice, their own voice being used against them when the time comes to charge them. The somewhat heavy and old technology and thick wire that made its way up to my chest, made it happen, pulled it off and did a great job. If your listeners ever want to look up back in the day, it was called the Nagra. If you remember those devices, uh, I remember them. Well, think of the Nagra that it's probably the size of a Apple iPhone XL. It had two reel to reels and it was the best quality recordings, but there's only so many places that you can hide something like that. So imagine today having to put your iPhone and secreting it on your body and running a wire equivalent to what Apple would give you for uh, headphones and having it secreted somewhere on your body. That's what it was like. For all I knew, he could have said, Dan, stand up. Let's go into the men's room, pat me down. For whatever reason, he didn't. And it was a calculated effort. Damn, this is the first time you're meeting this guy. How do we know four other people won't show up? How do we know they're not going to ask you to go to the bathroom and open your shirt up? And I says, well, have the surveillance team close by and we're just going to have to take that chance. We need this evidence. I actually have a photo of a Nagra recording device on my website. I'll put that photo also in the show notes for this episode in case anybody wants to look at how big it is and what it looks like. Excellent. Yeah, that was the first big break. Remember this time frame began in June of 1998. So June, July, August, September, and then it really, really came to a head in October. Hi, it's Jerry. If you're enjoying this case review with Dan Simone and stories about undercover operations and the mob in general, then I want to tell you about a true crime podcast I think you'll love. Deep Cover, Mobland, is the true story of a high-rolling Chicago lawyer who fixed cases for the mob back in the 70s and 80s. And he did it for decades until he decided to betray the mob and work for the FBI. He wore a wire to expose a black market where politicians were bought 
and justice was sold, where, for the right price, even murderers could walk free. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Jake Halpern takes listeners on a wild journey into a world of corruption, murder, and mayhem, the effects of which are still playing out in Chicago courtrooms today. Now, I loved season one of Deep Cover, but I'm especially loving season two because the FBI investigation in Deep Cover Mobland is a spinoff of Operation Grey Lord, which I reviewed with former FBI agent Terry Hake and FBI Retired Case File Review episodes 24 and 25. You can listen to Deep Cover wherever you get your podcast. Now, let's get back to Dan in Las Vegas with those East Coast mobsters. What were my days like? I'd go into this outcall business as the manager, and I'd work till the evening hours. Then I would either frequent places or get together with, let's just call them other bad guys, till late in the evening, oftentimes going out for dinner. And that's an opportunity to blend, build rapport, and kind of get on their good side. If I had to make tapes and do recordings, I would come home. I'd listen to the tape a little bit just to make sure that it worked. And if it was good, I knew that it would stand on itself. I'd go to sleep. And then some mornings I woke up very, very early and I would have to hand off the tapes to my FBI contact agent. And that was done in a series of maneuvers out and about in Las Vegas. Okay. You had to go back a little bit because I know that you had mentioned that it's legal out calls, escort service is legal in Las Vegas. Either you mentioned that or one of the newspaper articles that you sent me explained that. So you're actually operating, you're sending out men and women to entertain <laughs> people that are visiting Las Vegas. Is that the case? Can you imagine what the government thought when the FBI in Vegas said, hey, this is how we need to make this happen. Imagine conservative lawyers hearing that. We basically had a skeleton staff and in essence, we were kind of considered the worst place to work because we didn't get a lot of calls. We didn't want a lot of calls and we didn't have a lot of business. We basically had people on call back then it was a pager. So Johnny and Mary were escorts back then you could work for three or four different escorts. And then if you got a page. You'd call the number back and they'd say, hey, this is Casablanca West. And Mr. Johnson is in room four or five at the Flamingo. He would like an hour of entertainment. Back then it cost a hundred dollars and the entertainment company, Casablanca, would split with the escort $50 each way. And then if the escort decided to provide any other services, which the other belief was the FBI thought that there was illegal prostitution and a term not heard back in 1998, but clearly heard today, human trafficking was at the core of this. Were these people able to work on their own? Were they being kind of held kind of hostage for some reason and things of that nature? Part of this wasn't just take down the mob. It was learn about this industry. Are people being trafficked? All that type of stuff. We did our best and we actually had a handful of quote, on call escorts. We made them sign agreements that basically said, you cannot engage in acts of prostitution and things of that nature. It's against Las Vegas County code, this, the state law that you will be fired And Casablanca West does not support this type of activity. And the handful of folks that we had worked there signed it, but they'd always complain that they really didn't want to do much for us because other outcall agencies had different rules and they could make more money with them. So it was kind of a fine line to walk through, but it was also important for us to gather intelligence on how other businesses operated. And more importantly, did they let those independent contractors operate freely or were some of those people kind of being forced to do that against their will? 
hope that answers your question. It really does. So in a sense, this is going to allow the case agent to potentially have some spinoff cases other than just what you're working on with the mob. Right. Like any real organized crime effort, there's a lot of tentacles and they go in a lot of different directions. What our goal was to not just look at one thing, it was to see and gather as much intel as possible, try to uncover any multitude of criminal activities that were going on out there, Jerry, because you know, you have that amount of money going on. You've got people coming in from all over the world. It's a recipe for bad things to happen potentially. So we want it to be eyes open as much as you can. I'm also curious as to the telephone interception, the hacking part of it. I would imagine that's a case in itself for potentially someone to look at. Those three owners may be operating their businesses legally, but the interception of phone calls and the hacking that they're doing and forwarding the phone calls is definitely not legal. Is that something also that the FBI was looking into? It absolutely was trying to understand, was their basis, was this real, or were these guys so good that they spent so much on advertising that most of the customers flocked to them and this was just a rumor. And the belief was that these three folks controlled someone inside of Sprint, which was then the telephone company that serviced Las Vegas and had developed some type of program that worked against Chris DiCarlo, Casablanca West, and a small group of others where every other call, two out of three calls would get illegally called forward. That was something that was always being investigated and continued to be investigated after the end of the LCN portion of this case. We'll cover how that ended at the end of our story. Cool. Again, four months. I told you a little bit about the way my day went. Carmine Borelli's job for Chris DiCarlo and the friends back in New York was to find these three owners. Where do they live? What kind of cars do they drive? What are their work hours? What are they frequent? Where do they go out? Where's their favorite restaurant? All that type of stuff. And we really tried to slow roll that, Jerry, because we knew once we turned over a portfolio of documents that said, this guy lives here. He eats at this restaurant every Wednesday. He gets up, he's in this car. We were afraid that they would act on this without involving me and something bad could have happened to one or three of these owners and that the FBI would be liable in part because we told Chris DiCarlo where they lived or where they frequented. So we continued to try to slow roll this for a period of time and October rolled around the New York group got restless. So we're at this four months. Now keep in mind what else is happening for the last four months, other than some money that DiCarlo is kind of skimming from Casablanca West, which oftentimes was FBI money to make it look like the business was legit. There were four months gone by with no tribute. And remember, tribute is money often kind of shared up the chain in the mob circles. It's like somebody missing your car payment for four months and the company that you bought your car from is not too happy. Well, four months go by and the car is not sending any tribute money. Then one day, a really important phone call happens and it comes from Mario Stefano in New York. Mario is an older gentleman older Italian gentleman who knew Chris DiCarlo's father back in the day. Mario had a really important message. He says, I'm sending three guys to you to move this along. And they're the best. And right away I'm going, Ooh, this can't be good. And then he says this, they are Peter's personal team. You got to remember, this is the Gambino crime fan, John Gotti. Well, guess what? John Gotti had a brother. Peter Gotti. Wow. I'm thinking Mario is sending John Gotti's brother, personal team to Las Vegas. This is amazing. Peter Gotti's personal henchmen are coming to Las Vegas. And my job was pick them up at the airport and do whatever they ask you to do. 
Could it get any better? Could it get any more interesting? And wow, the FBI in Las Vegas was really working in a lot of ways. We were preparing for court authorized wiretaps on Krista Cardinal's office. We were preparing for court authorized wiretaps on hotel rooms where these gentlemen would stay on their arrival because one of the things that Carmine Borelli did for Chris was, hey, I've got a friend at such and such hotel and I can get our friend's rooms at no charge. They'll do it as a favor for me. The Carlo thought that was great. Well, that was the FBI paying those hotel bills, Jerry. And that allowed our <laughs> technical teams to install the necessary cameras and microphones. Uh -huh. They always say, beware of someone offering you something free. And in this case, that didn't bode well for Mr. DiCarlo and the three gentlemen. Now, you also got to remember, this is pre-September 11th, 2001. Airports were a lot different. Visitors could go to the gate, meet people. You could carry almost anything in your luggage and no problem. So the day finally arrived, Jerry, I'd go to the Las Vegas airport with Chris DiCarlo. And here comes Peter Gotti's rehenchman. Number one, Kenny Burns, six foot six. I think you have the pictures of these folks. Yeah, you, and, you gave me a nice montage of photos. And so I'll also put that on the show notes. Great. Well, Kenny's a big guy, six, six, probably 270, 260. And he brings a luggage that looked like a softball bag. I pick it up to go. Help him put it in the van. I hear clink, clink, clink. And I'm like, dude, what do you got in your luggage? He unzips it and he shows me like three aluminum baseball bats. I says, what'd you do? Come from like a softball game? And he laughed and he had this real deep laugh. <laughs> he says, I'm old school. These bats have been used to break some knees before and maybe here too. Tools of the trade tools of the trade. And each of these gentlemen were experts in their own craft. Mr. Anton Nelson traveled light. Guy practically had no luggage. And I was like, Mr. Nelson. And Kenny says, Hey, Anton doesn't talk much, but we need to take him by the auto art store because he needs to get something. He tells me Anton used to be a mercenary. Now he joined us. He says, you know what Anton's claim to fame is? I'm like, don't have an idea. Tell me. He says, Anton went to his dentist one time and was getting a root canal and the dentist really hurt him and he was mad. So he went back later that night and blew up his dentist's office. Anton's an explosive expert. So that's why we got to take him to the auto parts store. He needs to get some things. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? So now we've got old school baseball bats where I'll break your knees to this guy's ready to put a concoction together to blow something up. The third guy looked grandfather. I know you have the picture. Vincent Conjusti, older gentleman, small carry on bag. He reminded me of my grandfather. He doesn't say much, gets in the car. And I hear them talking to each other. And they kept referring to Mr. Conjusti as the aspirin. I'm like, aspirin. I'm like, can this be like, you know, the old classic mob nicknames? So we're going along. And finally, I just wanted to ask. I said, Mr. Kajusti. He's like, yeah, kid. I says, if you don't mind me asking, I just got to wonder. I hear these people referring to you as aspirin. And I was just wondering how you got that name. And the entire, it was a van that we were in. Silence. Jerry, it felt like it was like five minutes of silence, but it was probably about 20, 30 seconds. And I thought, oh, what did I do? Did I get this guy angry? And next thing you know, he says, kid, I got the nickname aspirin because when the family has a headache, they call me and I get rid of it. Well, Jerry, I kind of wondered all the way back to the hotel, how he gets rid of it. Well, I had a chance to help him with the luggage and in Vinny, the aspirin can juice these luggage. And again, this is pre 9-11. Open it up, a few little changes of clothes, a blue Nikita drill and various drill bits from six inches to, I mean, like two feet, the kind that the TV installation guy would drill for your wall. I then come to learn that Mr. Conjusti's specialty was that he would drill into people's knees, arms, and if necessary, heads to get them to talk. And obviously if they didn't talk, you kind of knew what the outcome was, whether it was the technical folks 
that did the work at Sprint in the illegal call forwarding to one of the three owners. Somebody was going to get drilled on the trip is what their plan was. This added a whole new dimension. You know, Dan, this is just so wild to me because they're bringing evidence of their illegal torturing activities with them. Like they couldn't just get there and go to the store and buy this stuff. They have it on their person. Well, you hear of athletes saying, oh, hey, I'm going to wear the same socks because uh, it's good luck or whatever. This is their personal, this isn't just another baseball bat or another drill, just like probably contractors. Maybe they like DeWalt, maybe they like Makita. It's worked for them in the past to whatever extent. They were partial to their particular tools of the trade. They took pride in it and that's why they brought it with them. You also gave me a photo of the inside of their luggage, which I think is pretty cool too. So you can actually see these items that they brought with them. Yeah, I understand years later, some of those items were briefly, I was told I didn't confirm it and I didn't see it, were on display at the Mob Museum, Las Vegas. Interesting place if you ever go to Las Vegas, visit the Mob Museum. I've been there. Pretty cool. I got to see some of my friends, FBI agents featured there in some of those cases. So yeah, it's a cool place. Sure. And I think we thought that when you went through new agents class, a guy named Jerry went through new agents class, but Jerry was the case agent on this case in Las Vegas. Yeah. New agent classmate was the case agent on this case. It's a good thing that we got those hotel rooms and that we were able to put the cameras and their microphones in there. And even amongst bad guys, bad guys don't necessarily all get along because they're bad guys. Anton Nelson, the mercenary, and Vinny the Aspirin didn't care for Kenny Burns. They had talks in their motel room about once we finish this job, maybe we'll leave Kenny behind. Ha 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 ha. Not only now did we have to worry about three escort owners, what's the chances any time that two of the hitmen would turn on a third Things were really heating up and it was mid-October and it was probably right around Columbus Day weekend. And the next call that comes in is from Kenny Burns, big kind of bombastic personality outgoing. And he says, Hey, we think we found a guy who knows one of the people that did the call forward. Oh, okay. Um, found him. Yeah. Is he going to talk? Burns is like, oh yeah, he's going to talk. Uh, uh, uh. And he says, the aspirin is about ready to go to work on him. In the background of the call, Jerry, you heard the drill. Zzz, zzz, right? So imagine a dentist office times 10 and it's in the background of the call. Meanwhile, court authorized wiretaps on the business where they had them on the phones, the FBI had to make an important decision. Would they really hurt this guy? Supposedly he was laid out on the table, strapped down. They were going to grill him for info, kept saying that he didn't know anything. Vinny the Ashburn was about to start drilling into who knows what part on this guy's body. So the FBI leadership said, we can't allow that to happen. And what they did was they had a team of agents storing Chris DiCarlo's office. In custody is Chris DiCarlo, Teddy Burns, Anton Wilson, and Vinny the Ashburn Kajusti. They take this gentleman. Charles and basically untie him. I and mean, you think the guy would be so thankful, right? That guy, Charles, refused even years later to speak to the FBI. I don't know why they came after me. I don't know anything and I got nothing to tell you. And he stuck to that the day he got rescued off that table right before he was drilled to years later when Jerry and other agents in Vegas tried to speak with him. He pulled the inevitable. Hogan's heroes, Sergeant Schultz, I know nothing routine on everybody. That became a dead end. Ultimately, years later, whether it was real or whether it was fake, the FBI, in conjunction with security folks at Sprint, were never able to determine whether the phone systems were infiltrated and the call forwarding was legitimate or was it just a hoax. That's one part of the investigation that never got solved. Wow. 
Now, I take it that surveillance teams were following each of these three guys that had come into town. And so they were aware before you were told and heard the drill in the background that this guy had been snatched. Right. It all happened quickly. The surveillance teams understood them to go into the office and depending on the exact location, what they could see, maybe there was, hey, you know, there's another person etc. And then of course the Title Three wire intercept would have gone active once they're inside and they could hear a lot of noise, but there was like a rung inside of a rung, but it wasn't until Kenny Burns made that call and explained what was about to happen that we really knew and had to intervene. That seemingly was the end of it because an hour later, I got a call from Mario Stefano in New York. He says, Hey, car money, you got to lay low. The guys just got pinched. I don't know the circumstances. Don't go near the office. Probably better for you to get out of town. Why don't you fly back to New York? Let's meet up and then we'll shift gears and I'll get you involved in some of our cigarette smuggling that we're doing up and down the coast. Remember we talked about things that go into tentacles. The thought process was, hey, the FBI sat down and says, Dan, we're not sure that maybe they didn't figure out that you're undercover and they're trying to lure you back there. Or this is another opportunity to get additional evidence on Mario Stefano and maybe some New York mobsters. Those that follow organized crime and FBI history, they know that one of the pioneers by the name of Joe Pistone, who did the movie Donnie Brasco, was one of the first and most successful infiltrators of Italian organized crime. Yeah, I've done an episode with him. It's fantastic. Great guy. And you know what, as we talk later in the show, I had the opportunity for Joe to come and teach and speak to new agents undergoing undercover training when I served in that unit. The thought process was the Joe Pistone undercover showed us that while organized crime is heinous and can do a lot of things, that they were put on notice back with Joe Pistone. You better not do anything to one of our agents, otherwise you're going to have a lot of problems. So we took the guess, the weighted guess, and put all the facts and circumstances. I ended up going to New York. I meet Mario Stefano for lunch at Peach Tavern. And to this day, I remember 18th and Irving Place in New York. Peach Tavern had these big bay windows that you can turn sideways. We had it all sketched out. FBI arrest team was going to come in, grab Mario. And I was going to jump out the window next to the table and escape. And that's exactly how it went down. The FBI arrest team comes in. They look to grab his boat. I flee out the window. Mario puts his hands up, gets arrested. And we thought that would keep my cover going as long as it needed to. So now we've got Kenny Burns, Anton Nilsson, Vinny Conjusti, Chris DiCarlo, and Mario Stefano, all in custody. And of course, they're remanded. The U.S. attorney was a gentleman by the name of Eric Johnson, who did a phenomenal job on the organized crime strike force in Las Vegas, putting his case together. And Jerry, you know, from your experience, everybody gets their own attorneys. They think they can beat the case. They don't realize the work that was gone into a case like this, the beforehand, the research, the electronic surveillance, etc. And of course, they were all out of hearing. Mario was in New York. It was the three henchmen in DiCarlo in federal court in Las Vegas. And we're not guilty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let us out on bail. Jerry and Eric, the U.S. attorney, said, Dan, I need to put you on the witness stand. I says, okay. So doors open up. I walk into the room. I get the evil stare down from... All the defendants, Chris DiCarlo, Kenny Burns, Anton Nelson, and Vinny Conjusti. And he thought, oh, Borelli is going to be a rat and he's going to dime us out. They wish that's all it was. So I took a seat. I raised my right hand. They said, state your name. And I says, Daniel DeSimone, state your occupation, special agent, FBI. And you should have seen the facial expressions on all those defendants change immediately. And of course, Eric Johnson, Mr. D. Simone, what has been your job for the last four months? And I said, I was acting in an undercover capacity as the day manager of Casablanca West. And I had the opportunity to pay Mr. DiCarlo $10,000. He explained to me 
his criminal intent. And we would just work down the line. There was a series of questions from the U.S. attorney back and forth, back and forth, where I simply laid out from an FBI undercover agent's perspective, everything that I saw, everything that I heard, everything that I recorded. And you could see the defendants with each of their attorneys, they're going wildly back and forth. I conclude my testimony. The remand by the judge is in place. One of the defense attorneys, I think, stood up and says, Your Honor, we'd like a recess. And what came out of that recess was they realized they had nowhere to go. In many cases, their own words and their own action were going to be used against them. So all their attorneys, Jerry, approached Eric Johnson and case agent Jerry, your FBI classmate, by the way, J-E-R-R-Y in his case. And they said, we want to plea. And the government countered with, if you all plead, we'll give you a group sentence and we'll give you a little reduction because everybody pled. And that's exactly what happened. They didn't fight it. They didn't go to court. Every one of those defendants pled guilty for a litany of federal criminal offenses for their actions that day. That is how Mr. DiCarlo, Mr. Burns, Mr. Nelson, and Mr. Conjucity ended up in federal prison for many years. My first question is, what about Tony? Did they suspect that Tony was the one that, well, he did introduce you. Did they suspect Tony was involved and was cooperating with the FBI? And what happened with Tony? That was the reason why we needed to get Tony out of town as early as possible. These folks aren't completely stupid. They knew, and part of the write-ups of the government alluded to the fact that there was a cooperating source. Now, that cooperating source was never identified, and that was part of the agreements they pled guilty. We didn't have to. If there was a trial, clearly Tony probably would have had to come out. They might have not been 100% sure, but it was pretty obvious that it would have to have been Tony. How did Dan get in there as the manager, etc.? Long story short, Tony was offered the witness protection program and declined it and chose to live out there on his own and relocate it to another part of the country. Keep in mind, this is almost 24 years ago. Vinnie the Asprey Conjusti died in prison from heart and diabetic complications. Anton had served his time and was out. And last I was able to tell was a home construction remodeler in the southern part of the United States. Kenny Burns wasn't so fortunate. He had what's called in, in our industry, Jerry, a tail. So he was out on, I guess, good behavior or something, but he had some other crimes that he did and they let him out early. Well, unfortunately, in addition to the time that he received for our case, he got a 17-year tail attached to that pretty close to the time he should be getting out. And Chris DiCarlo once kind of, you looked at him and you said, he's the kid that had it all. He had a profiting business, drove around in the nicest cars, wore the nicest clothes, looked like he walked out of GQ, has had a very challenging life. He did some time in prison. He ultimately got in trouble with the law again. And unfortunately, Chris DiCarlo, last I heard, was living somewhere up in Montana and was, in fact, out of prison. But every one of them received several years in prison. And unfortunately, Mr. Conjusti died in prison. That is how that case ended it. And that's what happened to all of these folks. I returned to Philadelphia and was there another couple of years when I got a call asking me if I wanted to go to FBI headquarters and be part of the undercover and sensitive unit. I accepted the opportunity. I went there and ultimately, as the years went by, I then next served as the unit chief of the undercover and sensitive operations unit. And ultimately, prior to my retirement, I oversaw the entire FBI undercover program, which is about the operations, about the cover tools that the FBI uses that we won't talk about today. And it's about the health of our undercover agents. I have a great affinity for the men and women of the FBI's undercover program. I have a lot of questions. Some okay. of them I understand that you won't be able to answer, but I'll ask them anyway so that people that are listening know that I tried, but I certainly don't want to do anything to jeopardize the program either. Can we first talk about the selection? Who makes a good undercover and how does the FBI 
know that or test that or evaluate that? Sure. There's a lot of potential scenarios where undercover operations are used by the FBI. Criminal, national security as well. So clearly a lot of backgrounds are important. I'll give you an example and then I'll answer your question more directly. Some of your folks, and I don't know if you've interviewed Philadelphia agent Bob Whitman on your show. Not yet, but I'm after him. I've been after him from the very beginning because, you know, Bob and I are good friends, but not. Well, well, we should make that happen. Because yes, Dan, we should. When I went to headquarters and I was contacted by the FBI equivalents across the globe, they had a challenging time that some of the artifacts of their country were stolen and were in essence on the black market across the globe. And I remembered that Bob Whitman told me that when he grew up, his family was into jewelry and art, and he knew a lot about it. And I says, Bob, I think I might have an opportunity for you. We've never really done art undercovers to the great degree in the FBI. So Jerry, for years, Bob traveled the world, Poland, Italy, the UK, you name it. And we worked together to solve cases involving art undercovers. When I say art undercovers, it may be a particular painting or it may be a particular sculpture. But to every one of these countries, it's a national treasure. And it's one way to really help diplomatic relations between countries. And why do I give you this example? Because not anybody could go in there and play that role going against bad guys in the art world, unless you really knew something about it. We can prep agents and teach them certain things, but when it's in your blood and you grew up around something, that's the best way to do undercover work. To your point, we see undercover skills being a variety of things. For years, when there was improprieties in the investment centers and banking industries, we found that we had a whole host of agents that had series five and series six security licenses because prior to the FBI, they were traders and so on and so forth. When we had to do that and needed that skill set, we actually kept a computer database at FBI headquarters that we were authorized to go in when we would look for undercover agents. And it would be, I need this type of undercover with this skill. We would have to go out and look amongst our agent base. And I will tell you, shortly after September 11th, that became a challenge for us because clearly we did not have many agents with a certain ethnic background, with a certain language familiarity, with a certain knowledge of countries overseas. And in conjunction, with our state and local officers, we did a special program and continue to this day to bring them in and certify them as undercover agents, duly deputized under Title 18, Title 21. And in essence, they are undercover agents for the FBI. And that is a great commitment and hats off to our state and local folks who have done that. There's no one particular skill set that you should have. Part of it is it's a body of work on what you bring to the FBI and the cases that we're looking for. Jewelers, we had seizures at the FBI. Seizures when people will see, oh, the U.S. Marshals is selling off these cars and he sees their planes, etc. But a lot of seizures come from court seizure orders. And what we did in some cases was we're using taxpayers' money when we have to pay a bribe or we, in, in essence, have to pay like I paid the 10000 to Chris DiCarlo. Got a little creative sometimes. And we found that we had a whole vault full of seized items. And maybe it was a watch that a particular defendant had seized from them in a court order. And it had 50 little diamonds in the watch. We pop those diamonds out, clean them up. And guess what? When we're doing a particular undercover case, instead of paying cash, we paid in loose diamonds. How would the targets of the case ever suspect? So that is something that we did. But the agent had to know about diamonds and how to talk about it. So it really needs, just like the FBI needs, 
a whole host of people with a lot of different skill sets who can investigate using their experiences, but also could use those same experience and skill sets in an undercover capacity. Very good. Then the next question is, could you talk about the scenarios where an undercover agent would be used? Because of course, in many cases, you don't need that. What has to happen in a case that allows you to say, okay, this is going to require a UCA? Oftentimes there are many different types of cases. Again, it could be a criminal case. It could be a cyber case. And an example of a cyber case is many times we've heard of people trolling on the internet, looking for children. Some of the earlier online undercover operations involved agents who portrayed themselves as a 15 year old, but used their skill sets in a chat room or their cyber skill sets to engage the other party when that other party tried to lure them somewhere and things of that nature. The use of an undercover operation is not something that you open a case today and do an undercover tomorrow. There's a whole host of investigative techniques that the FBI uses, interviews, surveillance, sources, court authorized pen registers, wiretaps, etc. In some cases that may only gather a part of the evidence that you need. It's really, I hate the term case by case, Jerry, but it really is kind of a case by case. Part of it is assessing the main targets in the case. Do they have any weaknesses? Would they be willing to be approached by someone who they haven't met before? In the case we talked about today, if Tony, the source had not done that one year in Rikers for the mob years ago, we probably wouldn't have had an in in Las Vegas case. It's all those factors that came together that said to the Las Vegas hierarchy management, this is a great opportunity for an undercover case, get up close and personal with the main targets of the case. Little did we know we'd be welcoming in Peter Gotti's henchmen to Las Vegas. What about the program do you think needs to get out there? Because remember, a lot of what I do is also very much directed towards crime fiction, books, TV, and movies, and what they get right and what they get wrong about the FBI. What about the undercover program would you like to correct for the public? Sure. Thanks. Much like in my early days in Los Angeles, people would call the office and say, I'd like to join the X-Files unit. And we'd say, we don't really have an X-Files unit. You've probably come across a young person who says, I want to join the FBI and become a profiler. Well, much like you just don't join the FBI and become a profiler, you don't join the FBI and become an undercover agent. Part of it is it's a skill that comes after you've really mastered the basics of being an agent, the interviewing, the interrogation the writing of your reports, possibly operating sources, maybe having trials, et cetera, and understanding the whole FBI stratosphere, whether it's criminal in nature or whether it's national security in nature. The program has been around for a while and believe it or not, I've got a picture. I don't know. I sent it to you of the first ever FBI undercover class. And coincidentally, it was held not too long after famed director J. Edgar Hoover passed away, as was taught to me by agents that came before me. Mr. Hoover was not a fan of undercover operations, so we were told. But in the mid-70s, the actual class got started. And there's really three prongs to the FBI undercover program. The agents who are trained in these classes. And we look for certain skill sets, how people operate under pressure, things of that nature. We put them through a whole host of scenarios, some of which are modeled after real former undercover cases. What would they do? Decision-making. You might be a great decision maker, but under stress, if someone has a gun to your head, how are you going to react? There's a whole host of scenarios that we do. Another part of the FBI is what we call the cover unit. Well, Dan couldn't have just magically appeared in Las Vegas as Carmine Borelli without certain things needing to be done. 
That's tradecraft. Those are methods and tactics. And frankly, those are the secrets of the FBI that need to remain the secrets of the FBI. So I'm not able to talk about that prong of the FBI program. Thirdly, and one that Mr. Joe Pistone and former director Free were very instrumental in putting together, and that was our safeguard program. And that really looks at the psychological fitness and well-being of an agent, even before they go into the program, has their mental well-being, what is their stressors? And you know what? We repeat that before they go into an operation, while they're in an operation, and when they come out of an operation. That will help us when we see certain stressors. And there's been times when we would have to remove agents from active cases because of certain things that were going on in the case that we felt were potentially dangerous and we needed to remove that agent. Generally speaking, that's a high level overview of how the FBI undercover program works without giving away a lot of the real secrets. Thanks, Dan. One of the things that I get asked about a lot, and that is on the individual, you talked about knowing about the stressors and stuff like that. But when an undercover agent is out there, how often does he get evaluated? Are you just picking up on things he says or emotions, or is he actually evaluated by a professional to make sure that he's got the right mind frame or mind space, that his mind is in the right place? a combination of all of that. There's a pretty good understanding of how that agent acted and his mindset before he or she went into that operation. Sometimes these operations could last days or they could be a spot track. I'll go do something for an hour or two and then you won't go back for two or three weeks and it's another hour or two. Some of these you can be by yourself for an extended period of time and that in itself could be a stressor especially if you've been part of anything for a while and you are taken out of that environment and you're into a new environment. The question always becomes, is Dan the FBI agent been out of the FBI too long? Is he potentially starting to identify with the group that he's investigating? We look for signs like that. We don't want that to happen for obvious reasons as well as for the mental health and well-being of the agents. Is there a team of psychologists? I don't know if you can... Yeah. In the Safeguard program, there are several professionals. I'll just kind of leave it at that. And there are standardized tests and there are specific tests generated from the FBI that look to assess and weigh certain things and score certain things. But it's also an observation as well. I talked about... I would try to get away in the morning and bring my tapes to my contact agent. Part of that is they should be looking at me. Do I look the same? Am I acting the same? Things of that nature. There are capabilities by the FBI to monitor the health and well-being of their agents using professionals and what I'll even term clinical professionals, all the way down to a contact agent saying, whoa. Dan's showing up and he hasn't shaven in three days. And the surveillance team said he's staying out the one in the morning and drinking with the guys. And what are we getting from this? You have to look for these stressors where people act. You have to act quickly if you see those stressors. There's been cases, like I noted, where we've had to pull agents out of cases for their own well being or because the ask of the criminal or terrorist group, for example, may be too much. They may ask the agent to do something that even under the limited authority that the law allows is just too far out there. Hey, we need you to do a contract killing. Can we pull it off where we maybe make them think we killed the person? Go find the person, tell them, hey, we need to put you in hiding, put an obituary in the paper, etc. Or is it just dangerous and we can't do that and that's going to end the undercover role there? There's a whole host of professionals that look at the agent's actions, mental health, and so on to determine not only are they good to put into a case, but should they stay in one? And clearly afterwards, what impact, if any, has this case had? There may be cases where after the undercover, Like I testified, there was no issues for me, but in some cases, 
we've had agents threatened and things of that nature. And imagine the uh, psychological stresses on a person like that, especially if they have a family that's living with them. We've had to relocate some agents across the country because of things like that. Well, that's a good question for me to ask you. At the time that you went out to Las Vegas, you're living out there now for months on end. Do you have a family at the time? And where are they? I was a single guy. So that made it relatively easy. It's really tough. Imagine someone saying, hey, listen, I'll do this case. And they've got a son or a daughter or a husband at home. So are they running from something or is the family that will root it that either dad or mom, whichever the other spouse can handle things. If you look at the movie, Donnie Brasco, you see some of that that played during Joe Pistone's undercover. And that was in the early days when maybe the FBI looked at it's a job and here's the case that needs to be done and learning about what that type of duress or influence has. Say you got a call, your sister was in a car accident or your mom's sick while you're doing that. You got to make up some kind of thing to pull yourself out of there for a while. Being single at the time in Las Vegas, it was easy for me. I didn't have a spouse or any children to worry about. And it was easier for me to focus on the job at hand. Okay. Good to know. I guess we're at the point where you mentioned somebody joining the FBI and thinking they're going to become an undercover agent. So I want to talk to you a little bit about when and why you joined the FBI and at what point you decided that you wanted to apply to the undercover program. Well, sure. And an interesting piece for all your listeners here that this entire case that I just talked about and my undercover exploits in Las Vegas would not have been possible without you, Jerry Williams, and the uh, people listening are scratching their head going, why is that? Well, in 1987, after graduating college and after spending five years in the military, my dream was always to join the FBI. As a kid, I was mesmerized by Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. on TV, Sunday nights at seven on ABC, the FBI. And I says, one day I'm going to do that. Keep in mind, I grew up in the coal regions in Pennsylvania, and that's kind of more of a dream than anything. But it was 1987 and it was actually President's Day. I had a typewriter and I typed the letter to the FBI in Philadelphia. In your office, sent me back a form that I filled out. And next thing I knew, April of 87, I was asked to come into the FBI Philadelphia office and take a test. Now, Jerry, I knew no one in the FBI. Didn't have a relative or anything like that. I was just a kid from the coal regions that went to Westchester University in Pennsylvania. After my time as an enlisted guy in the military, Westchester University has a great criminal justice program. I have to give them a nod for being part of the preparation for my career. And I remember you standing in front of us in the room that day. And you said, if you're going to go to the next level of consideration, you need to score this on your test. I was scared, but I was determined. And we took that test. I felt confident. Then I want to say it was around May 22nd. Now, things again, right? We're talking 1987, May 22nd, I go to my mailbox and there's a letter from the FBI. And I remember sitting down in my apartment on my sofa, looking at it for like 10 minutes saying, my future's in this envelope, one direction or another. And just like government agencies, the letter didn't begin, congratulations, you passed. It basically said your score on the special agent entrix examination makes you competitive for an interview. I had to read it a couple of times, but I was like, Hey, that's government speak for I passed. Shortly after I had an interview, I also then was looked at from a medical perspective. I had a physical fitness test and because I served in the military in the early eighties and did time overseas, I had to take a polygraph test. I don't know that you remember this, Jerry, because you had put so many great people into the FBI, but I had gotten a call from you one day who said, initially 
the Bureau wants you to wait, Dan. We said that because you were enlisted and not an officer, you might do better with a few more years in the private sector. And that was November of 87. And I was devastated. Long story short, I get a call from you in January saying, Dan, I've got good news. They took a look at your application, your scores and everything. And could you be ready to go to an FBI new agents class in February? I says, Jerry, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. I'll be there tomorrow morning if you need me. And he said, <laughs> we need to do two things. We need to give you your fit test again. And because you were overseas, you need to take a polygraph test. Well, I had never taken a polygraph test. And I came down to a closed FBI building. It was Super Bowl Sunday of 1988. I took my polygraph test and February 8th of 1988, I entered on duty with the FBI. Back then they called it new agents class 88 five and the five stood for the month in which you would graduate. Now I have to interject to let everybody know, and I've told this story many times before, I'm not that old that I'm bringing in people that are around my same age. It just happened that the SAC of the Philadelphia office came to me. I had less than five years in the FBI, but they were having a campaign of, of trying to increase the number of women and minorities. And he asked me to manage the program. So I did that. And I did that for about three years until I begged them to let me get back to investigating cases. That's why I was there at the time. And I am certainly proud that I played a small role in bringing you into the FBI. Well, I'm so thankful for you. And I always referred to you as the best applicant recruiter that the FBI ever had. Wow. I like that. <laughs> I'll take it. See, I knew way back when in the eighties, what the entire FBI agents association lauded you for this past November. So. There you go. Thank you. So you get in. And uh, I get sent to Los Angeles from my first office. Lots going on in Los Angeles, from bank robberies to fugitives. And one of the more interesting cases, and we can maybe talk about this at another time, but it was June of 1994. And I had a source who was able to locate people very well. As a matter of fact, we found several fugitives. Well, what happened in June of 1994, O.J. Simpson didn't show up for his court appearance. And the assistant agent in charge, Ron Iden, who now today is the head of security for Disney, called me and says, Dan, what can your source do to find O.J.? Long story short, Jerry, we were able to determine that O.J. Simpson, just days earlier, had purchased, then it was called Pactel cellular phone. I didn't have the phone number, but I had the account number. We turned that over to LAPD. They went up on an emergency wire, found it pinging off a cell tower on I-5. And I think everybody who was alive at the time knows the rest of that story. Wow. So that's <laughs> one of a whole host of adventures that an agent can expect to have when they join the FBI. And I fast forward 10 years from 1998 it was 2008. So imagine this in 1998, I am the manager of an adult entertainment escort business in Las Vegas for the FBI, duly authorized. 2008, I'm at headquarters and based upon some work I did in Italy, I was given the lead for the Pope's trip to the United States in 2008. Ultimately, I was knighted by the Pope. So I tell people, what? FBI, I was knighted myself, the directors of the FBI and secret service, deputy director of the FBI and the other folks were knighted by the Pope for our services that we did in securing his safety on his trip to the United States and for some of our long-term investigative support to the Vatican. So. From a recruiting pitch, and I know you're always into recruiting, Jerry, where else but the FBI can you go from being the manager of an adult entertainment and out call business to getting knighted by the Pope? Nowhere but the FBI is what I say. Wow. What a wonderful career you had. So when did you retire? I retired in 2011, had 23 years in, 
just before retirement, I had the opportunity to oversee the Domestic Security Alliance Council, where it was the FBI and unclassified intel sharing with the private sector. So I kind of felt I had one foot in my next world, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else that would be anywhere close to some of the cases and opportunities that I had. And when 50 rolled around, I left the FBI and took a job in the private sector, where today that position still allows me to support law enforcement and intelligence agencies with information from the private sector to help them do their job. I'm the Senior Director of Investigative Resources with Thomson Reuters. Our data and information help the private sector and the public sector in furtherance of their duties, uncovering fraud, assisting law enforcement agencies in every facet of what they do. And I'm very proud of that as well. So it wasn't like my umbilical cord got fully cut. I still get to support the FBI and the whole host of other state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies, as well as some private security and chief security officers. Fantastic. This has been a wonderful conversation, and I'm so glad that I was able to introduce you to the listeners, to my audience here. I like to end each of these interviews giving my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? I hope you're able to profile that one picture I sent you, Jerry, and in the event that people are listening to this, maybe in a car or whatever, it's a picture of a three-year-old boy who was just rescued from an international kidnapping. And the picture was taken just after he returned to the United States, stepped off the plane into the hugging arms of his grandma and was crying tears. And a little FBI hat was placed on his head by me and the photographers then snapped that picture. I will tell you that I joined the FBI thinking that I wanted to do so to catch fugitives and mobsters and terrorists and those types of folks. But that case, that kidnapping case taught me an important lesson. I had 10 years in the FBI at that time. There's no greater reward than helping people. And do you know, 14 years later, I received a note at FBI headquarters. It was from the three-year-old boy, now 17. And he said, Mr. D. Simone, I've graduated high school. I'm going to college. I'm going to learn computers. I don't know what my life would have been like had you not rescued me. And I just want to say thank you one more time. Jerry, that's the heart at the FBI. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Dan DeSimone, photos of the Gambino crime family crew sent to Las Vegas, and of the drill, baseball bat, and other tools of their trade that they brought with them. There are also other images from the case and several news articles. And you don't want to miss that photo of the little boy who Dan helped rescue in a kidnapping case he marks as the highlight of his FBI career. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked the episode by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode or you can go to my website and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the right-hand corner. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI, books written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast, nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist of 20 cliches about the FBI. I would love it if you also checked out the link for my books. My FBI for Armchair Detectives nonfiction series enables readers to discover who the FBI is and what the FBI does, debunking misconceptions about the FBI found in books, TV, and movies. 
and my Philadelphia FBI Corruption Squad procedural series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler. My books are available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks wherever books are sold. And if you've already picked up copies, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams.